And I want to remind you um, as we begin that uh, the mission of our group, Women at Arden, is aimed at elevating women within our company by providing opportunities and resources to increase their visibility while developing vital leadership skills that further enhance the network of women. And that's our mission statement for Women at Ardent. And now I'd like to move over to our Connect to Purpose. And as a reminder, when we did the questionnaire for potential topics, congratulations, Ruby, surprise. It's my understanding a group of individuals at Bailey are gathered together uh, to watch the webinar and Sherry today. So Ruby, um, I was just sharing that we asked individuals to highlight uh, individuals in our company or outside our company that has an impact upon them and their professional development. And this is what one member, Ruby um, uh, Triplett, is the CNO at Bailey Medical Center. And this is what one member of the team said. Ruby is a consistent contributor to her facility's success and is a tireless champion for patients and employees alike. When we asked others about Ruby in the survey, they said that Ruby motivates them because she is strong, decisive, intelligent, and a supportive leader and a manager. Ruby is an excellent role model for all employees. They said she constantly leads, shows empathy, and advocates for all. So Ruby's leadership empowers members of her team to challenge themselves and provide the absolute best care possible. Which leads us in today's topic for today, advocating for yourself at work and in life. And I'm so excited to introduce our speaker today, Sherry Malone. She is the CEO of Lovis Women's Hospital. I feel like it's been an incredible privilege to be able to work with Sherry for a number of years. And I've seen on the sidelines what she does in terms of advocating not only for her hospital, for her employees, and for the community as a whole. So the story of Loveless Women's Hospital really demonstrates Sherry's vision and her advocacy and action. In 2003, she became the CEO of Northeast Heights Medical Center, what is today now Loveless Women's Hospital. Her vision was to have a hospital for women of all ages with adult services, surgical units, med surge, ICU, and one space. To achieve this, Sherry advocated for her vision, bringing OB services within Loveless and later adding the much needed NICU services so that women and babies did not have to be transferred from her hospital. Since then, Sherry continues to challenge the way things are done for the benefit of all of us. So with Sherry's advocacy, Loveless Women's Hospital is what it is today, which is a remarkable place to be and to work. So I'm excited to hear what Sherry will share with us today. Well, thank you all for letting me speak with you today. I wanted to start out by congratulating Ruby. Some of you may not know that Ruby actually started her career um, in Arden with Loveless Women's Hospital, and we hated to see her go, but we're really excited about what she's accomplishing at Bailey. So congratulations, Ruby. And this is a little difficult for me not to see your faces. I'm used to speaking to people in person, so I'm going to just pretend that I can see you guys out there. First of all, I wanted to go over kind of the topics that I'm going to cover today. It's a variety of topics, but they really all tie together about advocacy. First, I'm going to talk about stereotypes and why do they matter to women and to men? How do you determine who you want to be when you grow up? Seven steps to advocate for yourself at work and outside of work. I want to talk a little bit about networking and can it really help? I think it can. And paying it forward. So I want to start out with a cartoon. I always like to throw some cartoons in here. And the first cartoon, we've, we've lost the cartoon. There's the first cartoon. It's two guys talking and one says, we need to get an equal pay expert in here. And the second man says, let's get a girl. It'll be cheaper. Uh, there's some truth into that. And then the next one is boys and girls with their toys. Boys have trucks and girls have dolls. So that leads us to stereotypes. And you know, we still see in the business world today that women are a minority in leadership roles. And surprisingly, this holds true across all lines of business, nonprofit sectors, the government, military, and yes, even in health in healthcare. And when talking about women at Arden, David Vandewater noted that 78% of our workforce are women. And he talked about lower level and mid-level management posi positions and a good percentage, a majority of those 
are held by women. Yet when we get to the executive ranks, only 39% are women. Well, stereotypical thinking is prevalent and it's pervasive. It's often subconscious because this way of thinking begins really early in childhood. It's taught unknowingly by our families and it's pervasive even in elementary schools. From birth, society really works hard to confine our behaviors within rigid lines. Children are taught which colors, which games, which books are for boys and which are for girls. And I have a story for you about my going to college a long time ago back in the South and some stereotypically thinking uh, that was held at that time. Hopefully it's not still out there, but when I was getting ready to prepare to go to college, my family really started a campaign with my mother to try to convince her to not let me go to college. They said it was really a waste of money and time and my time and efforts would be better spent finding a good husband. So I had a really uh, remarkable grandmother and thank goodness she stood up and she said, wait a minute, she has all the time in the world to get married. If she wants to go to college, let her go to college. So thank goodness for my grandmother, I got to go to college. Gender-based stereotyping is alive and it's well in business. And you guys, men and women do it. Alice Eagley from Northwestern University and Ann Koenig from the University of San Diego wrote about research on how stereotypically thinking is really holding women back from leadership roles. They noted that people associate leadership with agentic traits, those conventionally masculine descriptors like assertive, forceful, dominant, and competitive, and that women were more often associated with communal traits like affectionate, compassionate, warm, and gentle. So this really makes it a lot easier for everyone to perceive men as being successful leaders and much more difficult for women. And then when women try to conform to those masculine traits, they often face backlash for bucking the norm. According to a study by Catalyst, they noted that it's often these taking charge skills, those stereotypically masculine behaviors that are seen as prerequisites for top level positions. Senior managers, both men and women senior managers, perceive differences between women and men leaders that don't exist. In an analysis of more than 40 studies, leadership researchers found very, very little difference between women's and men's leadership. So senior managers do seem to be applying that same old stereotype to corporate leadership. Women take care, men take charge. So what now? We've got to learn to advocate our, for ourselves. Know that these stereotypes exist. They're pervasive, but remember they're often unknowing. So next I have a cartoon from, for you from Charlie Brown and Linus. And Charlie Brown says, what do you think you'd like to be when you grow up? And Linus says, outrageously happy. Well, we may have to look a little bit beyond that to determine who do we want to be when we grow up. And, you know, I think that's something that we look at through different stages of our life. We're constantly having to attack this. So kind of first of all, focus on a little shorter term, maybe just the next year to five years. If you try to plan out a, a plan for your whole life, that's a little bit scare, scary. So maybe start with just one year to five years. That way you really can get started. But also remember when an opportunity presents, don't be afraid to jump on it. I had one of those. I kind of had a one to five year plan and my boss came to me and said, I want you to take over Northeast Tights and turn it into a women's hospital. That was not on my plan. So I said, of course, no. Well, thank goodness my boss was very persistent and he convinced me to take on that position, which was one of the best things I've ever done. So you have your plan, but you may have to jump off the plan a little bit. Also pay attention to your work details. Note in your daily work life, what really excites you? What makes you feel fulfilled? As well as those things that really are kind of unpleasant for you. And see how you can plan a next step around building on those things that really do fulfill and excite. You know you're always gonna have parts of your job that you don't really like that aren't, aren't your cup of tea. But try, try to find that next position, really building around those things that do excite you, that you really do enjoy. Find your passions and apply them to your professional life. Now, this may be a little bit difficult for some of us to think we could really do what we love in life, in our work life, but start with writing down those things that you love in life, not necessarily at work, but in life. I read an article by Karina Gordon Barnes and she talked about finding your passion. 
She said, when you look at this list that you create, it may look like a bunch of unconnected things. It may sort of look like uh, looking in your kitchen cupboard and you see a bunch of items and you try to figure out what are you going to cook with all these ingredients. Once you make that list, do try to pull out the commonalities among all of those ideas. For example, I love building things. I love to remodel, like to reorganize a space, and I enjoy public speaking, something that's really surprised me. Wow, this sounds, sounds to me like a CEO position, building new programs, reorganizing a service line, commuting, communicating ideas to people. What do you think, maybe? Natalie Ottenwright from Top Resume said, stay open to possibility. Let your journey evolve. It's okay to not know where the road will take you, but just that commitment of walking a few steps every day is enough. And she also noted that each individual needs to find their own version of brave. Discover what risks work for you. And I, I really like this. She said, the path of passion is where you do things that scare you enough without leaving you in a constant state of fear. So expand your comfort zone rather than totally leaving it. Talk to others in a position that you wanna be. Talk to other people and see what is their job really like? What did, they, what did it take them to get that position? And see what advice they might give you in moving forward or just moving differently. Continue your education. I can't overstate the importance of this. You'll learn so much. You'll have the ability to mingle with other professionals, to network. And really importantly, you will be able to show others that you have what it takes to succeed. And you've got that hard work ethic to get a really difficult job done. I firmly believe that education is never wasted. And meantime, do the very best in your current position. As you're planning for that next step, it's easy to overlook your current work. But one of the most important components of any job search is continuing to excel in your present role. And your hard work will definitely pay off. First, companies want to keep those high performers around and others will be willing to give you positive references. And even your boss may connect you with really important leaders. So next, the picture is sometimes you have to be your own hero. So let's go to advocacy. You really do have to be your own hero. Marlene Komar is a writer for Bustle, and she came up with these seven ways to advocate for yourself, which I think are, are really very helpful. helpful. First and foremost, believe you are deserving. Before you go into your boss's office, you have to be 100% on your side that you deserve whatever it is you're about to go in there and fight for. Lisa Evans at Fast Company pointed out that in order to be a good self-advocate, you need to have self-confidence. If you don't believe that you're the best candidate, you'll send out that vibe. So you can't go in thinking, well, maybe I don't deserve this, or maybe I'm not really ready, or maybe I should ask for less. You need to have full conviction or don't go forward at all. Secondly, think up ways that you can make your request a reality. Don't just walk into your boss's office with a, a request and expect them to do all the legwork to make it happen. When you rely on someone else to move you ahead, you could end up waiting a long time. And remember when you're advocating for yourself, it's all your responsibility. So take that responsibility into your own hands, draft a game plan on how you can do this. And no matter what your job description says, your job is really all about making your manager's life easier. So find ways that you can support your boss and include those ways in your conversation. What can you do to make your boss's job easier and help make them look good? Three, keep emotions out of it. The conversation with your boss is not about what you feel, it's about what you deserve. So leave your feelings out of it. Leah McLeod is a career coach with The Muse and she said, when you're sharing what you need in a difficult conversation, stay calm, stay focused and unemotional throughout that meeting. You'll want to fo focus that conversation on what you need rather than casting blame or criticizing others. Keep it to the point, keep it clear and professional. And that's the best way you'll get your request heard. Four, tailor your ask towards who you're asking. Bosses respond best when you explain how you reaching your goals will help them further theirs. 
So make sure your requests are tailored toward the bottom line of the person you're asking. It's not enough to just know yourself. You have to know who you're trying to appeal to. Five, don't ask for less in order to increase your chances. Just because you ask for less, it doesn't really increase your odds. First of all, your boss doesn't even know you're asking for less. You just end up cheating yourself. Six, be specific on when you'd like these changes to happen. Once you have your cards out on the table, don't forget to mention when you want to get this thing started. And seven, take charge, even if you get denied. Now, this is really important. As you move forward, you will have denials. You've got to be able to work through that rejection and keep moving forward. I like to say you'll never learn to ski if you don't fall down. So when you go in, you, you don't get your request, continue to take baby steps trying to meet that request on your own time. So continue to put that plan together and just wait for another opportune time to present. Just don't give up. I think my boss, Ron Stern, has seen me utilize this concept. No is just for today. Tomorrow, that no can certainly turn into yes. Advocating for yourself can be scary, but in the end, your boss and other leaders will respect you. They'll respect your confidence and your self-awareness. Next, we have a cartoon about a poor, lonely man on an island all by himself, and he says, thank God, somebody to network with. Well, that's probably not most of us. Some of us are a bit uncomfortable with networking, but networking is a great way to learn from other professionals. It helps you make connections, connecting with other leaders. It helps you build your business. It gives you ideas on how other businesses are operating. So here are some ideas on how you can get started, because if you're like me, this isn't really a comfortable area. So first, try to work within like organizations. Join maybe your hospital association or a business healthcare association. You could become a member of the Chamber of Commerce, or you could become part of a nonprofit group that supports your work. For me, that would be maybe the American Heart Association or the March of Dimes. All of these places need volunteers, they need help, they need support, but at the same time for you, it's a great networking opportunity. And you can also use these outside of work areas to really hone your leadership skills. You could chair a committee, or you could lead a fundraising event, or you could even chair the board. It will really help you polish your leadership skills while you're learning from other leaders in other industries. And lastly, we have Snoopy paying it forward. I've had some incredible, incredible opportunities as I grew up with people paying it forward for me. When I was in college, I had a professor that said, you have to go to graduate school, and she just took me under her wing to help me get prepared to go to graduate school, and without her, I don't think I would have advanced my education. When I first took my job at Women's, David Vandewater helped me meet other leaders of women's hospitals. He opened the door so I could meet with them and learn from them. My own Loveless Women's Hospital governing board members, some incredible networking women there, I took a leap of faith and I asked them to help me start networking. Well, they've never stopped. They've introduced me to all kinds of people, all kinds of boards. Their generosity has been just invaluable to me. And I'm still trying to find ways to do more of this and to do this better and paying it forward to others. So in closing, to be your best self-advocate, first you have to believe in yourself. Lori Hanau, founder of Global Roundtable Leadership, says, I trust myself and my unique gifts. I trust that I'm in this workplace with purpose. I trust that bringing my gifts forward is the best way I can be useful. Second, sell yourself effectively. Executive coach Jerry Valentine says, as with all things, it's always up to us to make the case for how we can help, not wait for our companies to come to us. So you really have to understand your company. You have to understand what their problems are, what the market's doing, and you go out there and sell it. You know, Paul Kappelman starts every Ardent podcast with purpose and clear direction. And that's what you need to really sell yourself effectively. And third, go out there and sell it to your boss, your CEO, to everybody. If they don't buy it, then you need to understand why they're not buying it. Always remember, it's on you to make the case, not on others to see how your strengths are valuable. So lastly, Mo Carrick. She wrote, Fit Matters, How to Love Your Job. And I love this saying, give yourself 
the green light to look at your superpowers with fresh eyes and an open heart. Resist your natural sense of humility that tells you to hide your light under a bushel. Deep and real self-awareness looks good on you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sherry. And I want to encourage everyone, if you have questions, to please make sure you utilize the chat function and we can get some questions going for Sherry. I actually um, want to start with one here, Sherry, that we received. What is the most important lesson you learned in your journey as a leader? I think my most important lesson was learning to never give up. You're, you're not going to get what you want exactly when you want it or exactly the way that you want it, but you've really got to be persistent. You've got to stay for the long haul um, and, and don't give up. To me, that's the most critical thing. Don't give up. Great. Another one came in. How do minority women connect with mentors to shadow for positions? Well, I'm fortunate. I have a wonderful board member, um, and she's African American, and we've actually utilized her to help us uh, with some of our female leaders. She loves doing it. She may like go a little overboard, uh, but it's, it's really nice to try and connect people that have commonalities to see how they can really help mentor that other person. So we try to, we try to pair people up. In your presentation, you mentioned some stereotypes that you've come across or that you've encountered. Can you give us an example of when you faced some of these stereotypes? Oh, let's see. Clearly, as I was growing up, it was uh, things were very stereotypical in um, all of my high school um, and into my college. Uh, part of that I kind of fell into. Um, at a time in high school, I really tried to, to really honor those feminine characteristics and not do any of those masculine characteristics. And I really uh, became kind of shy and a little bit withdrawn as a result of that. Um, and thank goodness I had some strong women in my life that could kind of be a, a role model for me without me even realizing it. And I was able to kind of push beyond that my whole um, talk about going to college. If I hadn't done that, I, I would not have even gone to college. I would still be back in the South and married and uh, just have a really different life. Great. I think those are the majority of the questions. If anyone has any other questions that they would like to ask, again, please utilize the chat box. We have a couple more minutes and or please feel free to um, directly contact uh, the, the email and we'll make sure to get them to Sherry. Um, one just came in, Sherry, that is, uh, I, would, I would love for you to address is, how do I assert myself as a woman leader without hiding or masking my fem feminine strengths? Well, I think that's a great question. I think it's really important as a female, um, really as a male or a female, always be looking at that next position that you want. Look at how people um, act. How do they dress? Um, sometimes at certain levels in the organization, it's, it's fine for you to behave a certain way, dress a certain way, but if you're going to stay in that company, you really do have to look at that and figure out how can you fit into that, that next role. I think that's a, a real critical thing. Um, don't necessarily feel like you have to hide your femininity. I don't think I do that at all. Um, you don't want to, to flaunt certain things, but you, you can still be very feminine and still be assertive and dominant. All of those masculine characteristics that people feel are part of being a leader. I think you can do both of those very well. We have time for one more. What disappointments have you experienced in your career and how did you cope with those? Oh, I'll give you an example of when I was first trying to move up in leadership. Um, this was before um, I took my position with Ardent, and um, I encountered a, a, a difficult situation. Uh, was a physician, some physicians were involved and some staff, and um, they really didn't like what I was doing. And um, it, was, it was a little bit uncomfortable, uh, certainly for me, and they kind of stood in the way of me making an advancement. They basically said, I don't, I don't think she should move up. Um, and so I just had to stay the course. I had to not give up. I wasn't going to get what I wanted at that point in time, but I had to just stay the course. 
And it was interesting because about a year later, those doctors came back to me and said, oh, you really were right um, and totally turned things around. But it, it was hard. It's, it's hard when you see that disappointment. But just know as you move forward, you're never going to move upward without disappointment, without some rejection. And you've, you've got to learn how to work through that, knowing you still deserve it. You're just not going to get it right now. And I'm sure along with all of this advice comes having difficult conversations with individuals. Yes, yes. yes which I'm sure is a balance between um, staying that course. Um, we have time for one more uh, before we end. I know uh, what book helped you with your growth throughout the years when you were building your leadership skills? Oh, now that's a good question. I don't think I have an answer for that. I don't think I have a book that really helped me. I, I learned a lot, um, as I talked about education, I learned a lot in school. I did go back and get my MBA, and that was extremely helpful. Um, a lot of that wasn't really through a book. They tried to do things more current, and so you were reading a lot of, of current literature, not necessarily a book. But that MBA was invaluable to me to really help me see, first of all, my worth and my ability and really helping me learn from other people from different industries. That was really helpful in that particular MBA program. Wonderful. And we will be sure to give podcast and book recommendations after this meeting as well to help others. Well, again, if we did not get to your question or if you have any other questions for Sherry, um, please uh, let us know either via email or you can uh, reach out to the website that was indicated on the webinar. Um, and thank you, Sherry, very much. Thank you.